Top Med Talk. My name's Nick McGerrison and this is Top Med Talk. And on today's Top Med Talk, we're going to take a little bit of time to speak to our editor-in-chief. And that is, of course, Professor Monty Mython, the originator of Top Med Talk. How are you, Nick? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you about Top Med Talk. I'm going to ask you how it came about. I'm going to ask you what inspires you to do it and what's behind all of this. And I'm going to start with how did it start? It started by a visit to this building, Martin House property here, the studio at 1010 Great West Road, where I was introduced to this beautiful studio, uh, which has the ability to make these podcasts and communicate with the world. And uh, that prompted me to revisit what I used to call carbon-friendly conferencing, along with a colleague of mine, Hugh Montgomery. You know, basically, we should be communicating with much more of the world more effectively uh, whilst staying uh, close to home and burning fewer air miles. So that's uh, really what it's all about. Well, that brings me to the next question. Why podcast? Why not video? Many of us have been involved in quite a lot of video lecture experiences. There's plenty of it out there now. And when you look at the number of views, they're relatively disappointing compared to what we see the numbers of people downloading podcasts. So you reflect on that and think, well, how often am I going to actually watch a screen and choose to watch somebody giving a scientific lecture and it's it's pretty rare actually if i'm going to watch a screen i'm probably going to watch sport or a film uh, as i'm sure many people do and i talk to the youngsters about this they associate screen time with me time you know with relaxing whereas podcasting whether it's in the car when you're you know commuting on an airplane whatever it is it, it's just uh, a different way of catching up very easy to say well actually i don't want screen time at the minute i do need to get through this it's good for me it's just come up on the radio in my car effectively because if you use if you use the technology correctly and uh, great bring it on so the focus of top med talk is perioperative medicine the perioperative process overall the ambition for top med talk is to deal with all medically clinically population health related issues we've started with perioperative medicine in the broadest sense because that's where myself and my colleagues primarily come from so for the uninitiated what what is perioperative what does that mean so perioperative medicine often described as from the moment of contemplation of surgery until full recovery now a moment of contemplation of surgery sure some people do wake up one morning and say i really think i'm going to go and see my doctor because i think i might need a knee replacement or a hip replacement but the moment of contemplation of surgery in many situations is when your doctor says i'm going to refer you in to see a surgeon because you might need something done to make you better so it's really preparative medicine from, is from that moment, whichever one of those moments it is, through to wonderful, I'm fixed now, I've forgotten about my surgery, I'm home, I'm happy, I'm back to a full productive life and I'm paying taxes again. You know, I've known you for a while now and this is something that I'd really like to get to the bottom of. Why is it that you're so passionate about that? What what started that passion? So that passion really started me as a young doctor uh, being involved in giving an anaesthetic. So my primary trade is the delivery of anaesthesia to facilitate surgery. And uh, some poor elderly gentleman had a very poor outcome from the surgery. It was difficult, complicated emergency surgery. Uh, But I reflected on it all and thought, well, actually... Broadly speaking, we all could have done better here. Maybe he shouldn't have had the surgery at all. Once he needed the surgery, there's many things, I think, that on reflection we could have done better. And I sort of thought, well, particularly when it comes to elective surgery, when you sign on the dotted line to say, thank you, doctors, thank you, surgeon, you're going to make me better, the fact that you might be worse is just shouldn't happen we we've got to get to a point where that's not one of the options well, what do I, you mean by poor outcome I, well then i went on to do detailed research looking uh, as part of my higher degree thesis i'd already qualified done my qualifications and i was lucky enough to get a grant to study patients in great detail their physiology and their outcomes and when you go and visit the patients every day of the week and you make notes and a diary about how they're getting on it was a bit disturbing as to how many people were just not quite right afterwards. And the not quite right is the whole spectrum of uh, my wounds taking a little bit more time to heal than I expected through to uh, I appear to have had a stroke 
or, or in some situations now dead and uh, that really changed my life forever so why does the perioperative process give you a better outcome well if we agree that we have try and have zero tolerance of poor outcomes from major surgery so a long-term interest in outcomes of patients following in particular more major surgeries those you'd expect to have to go to a hospital for and the belief that we should have zero tolerance of anything other than Im- an improvement following surgery you know, the reality is that major complications occur in anything up to a sort of quarter of patients which just isn't good enough then the whole process is all about mitigating and managing risk. So we can all think of ways that we could give ourselves a better chance, things like getting fitter, uh, giving up smoking if we're a smoker, drinking less if we drink too much, uh, fixing our diabetes, our anemia, that long list of things. And then when we get into the, uh, have the surgery itself, there are multiple, multiple steps. It is a complex pathway, but we should be a applying best evidence-based practice as consistently as possible and when that is done outcomes are much better there are a number of different debates that get thrown up by the perioperative process do you want to give us an idea of first of all from a uk perspective and then let's move to the slightly more complicated area of america on a very positive note to start with we have common goals i used to work in the united states of america so 20 years ago there was quite a divide in the u.s view of delivery of healthcare and the uk view of healthcare. We're now very mid-Atlantic, I would say. So we have are speaking a very common language with very common objectives through the whole thing. One of the big challenges we still have, which is often discussed on Top Med Talk, is the way the healthcare systems are funded. So we're still, I think, you know, so privileged still in the United Kingdom to have our national health service, this single-payer, single-provider system that dominates with a small amount of private practice in parallel. The United States is traveling a very, very difficult journey, as they describe it, from volume to value. And what is meant by that is the volume equation is the fee-for-service model, whereas the value equation is much more akin to what we have in the National Health Service. And so and you can imagine, if, you're, if your business is medicine, uh, more and more medicine is more money, then perversely, even though we all want major complications not to happen, major complications are good business because there, there's more sickness and there are more tests to do and more drugs to give out and more patients to see. Now, that's all being changed to what's much more akin to what we have in the United Kingdom. That's this concept of accountable care organisations, of having a certain amount of money per patient in your system and the idea of receiving a bundled payment. So if we agree that right price for a hip replacement is this number of thousands of pounds, that's what the people are going to get for performing that hip replacement. So the best possible result gives you the greatest likelihood of keeping a margin uh, for, for, for doing that, which is going to make your, let's call it business, your hospital, uh, profitable. So no. one of the areas that often comes up in Top Med Talk uh, is the question of whether or not doctors should advocate healthy lifestyles. Yep. And that's a debate that varies depending on which side of the uh, Atlantic you're on. Do you want to speak to that? Well, I think we all agree we should advocate healthy lifestyles and we should probably try harder to lead by example. So one of the things that is reflected on quite often is if you go into a hospital, you often look around and say, I'm not really staring at a whole bunch of healthy people in the various different uniforms and whatever they might be wearing here. Some of these people look as though they should be leading by example. So, yes, we should advocate healthy lifestyles, but we should also try hard to lead by example. We often reflect on the fact that if you come to uh, one of our um, meetings in various different places, our food that's put on the table often includes you know multiple biscuits cookies cakes fried food everything we're telling other people not to do we're not we're not overwhelmed with fresh fruit and carb free dining there's a bit of push pushback though from patients isn't there particularly i suppose if they're uh, paying a fee if they get a doctor telling them to live healthily some people that gets up their noses doesn't it 
Yeah, well, uh, I think you have to dole out some tough love. You have to be honest with people. And and we have skirted around some of those issues because we've been a bit worried about exactly what you've stated. You know, in the words, if in the private practices, I'm a paying customer. Don't tell me what to do. But we are duty bound, I think, to 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 share the truth on those matters. Okay. And sometimes it's difficult because we're sharing truths that we can't quite manage to get under control ourselves, you know, a little bit overweight maybe, you know, not quite exercising as much as one should. One of the things that comes up a lot is the opioid crisis. Yeah. Um, what is the opioid crisis for the UK audience? And then do you want to expand on it a little as to whether or not the medical professions contributed to that? Well, uh, I mean, the opioid crisis is definitely in play in the United Kingdom and in much of the world now. But the um, most of, it's most often discussed in the US context. So it, it's now the a death from opioids, from narcotics, in other words, heroin-like drugs, opium poppy-like drugs is now one of the major killers in the United States of America. And within that is this disturbing reality that many of the, the uh, drugs that become available, particularly in tablet form, have got into the community as a result of them being prescribed for patients who've had surgery and prescribed in quite shocking quantities. So uh, some of the examples we've talked about on Top Med Talk is youngsters, people, teenagers under the age of 18, having teeth extractions, for example, and going home with 90 OxyContin tablets. Now, it's unlikely that they need any of those tablets, and if they don't take those tablets, it appears as though not many people uh, dispose of them properly, so they end up in bathroom cabinets and end up possibly being used for other reasons, for social reasons, or redistributed into the community in so-called pill mills, you know, being sold as street drugs, because um, some of the tablet forms uh, in particular that we've, we in the broadest sense, the community has worked very hard to produce pain-killing drugs that have the fewest possible side effects, that combination makes them the most addictive. So I've been travelling around America largely yeah. uh, with you going to conferences and I can tell that you love the work you do yeah. that's obvious and I can also tell that a lot of people uh, enjoy meeting you and they're excited to meet you and they they obviously enjoy the work that you do as well what would you say is the most personally rewarding aspect of what it is that you do uh, I think that if you as a result of communication, uh, particularly listening to people and then being able to share that listening with a broader audience, is if you say see large-scale change for the better, which I think we have in a number of situations, uh, I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that, um, that I did that, but I think that we, uh, communicators, ha have helped to make those things happen. And that gives me, definitely gives me a warm fuzzy feeling where i think well you know the need the needle has moved the dial has moved and and we collectively have tried to share this information and drive the knowledge base and make sure that we sh share that as effectively as possible and have helped to move that needle in the right direction and then what can listeners to top med talk expect in the future expect in the future more better faster uh, thinner better looking i don't you know it's, it's going to be wonderful that's the great thing about radio yeah just, yeah. You just need to get people with good voices. <laughs> That's all you need, isn't it? You've got it in the bag. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, man. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favourite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website, perhaps, or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.